Raj and Donna helping out. She's mainly at Ashton B in ACC campus. We got Jennifer at the end helping out. Joyce is here. And I forget anyone. Greg. Greg. Greg, yeah, of course, right <laughs> over here. So he's live captain. So if you can't come in here, there are students at wherever they might be, they're watching this as we go through this as well. So this is the first trial that we're doing, which is we're pretty excited about. And uh, Chen is here as well helping out. And we got Akil and Kasish helping out as well. Uh, so we'll first let Michael go through his presentation, um, and at the end we'll have question period. So please save your question till the end, and then we'll have, I'm sure we'll have enough time for you as well. So without further ado, Michael, take it away. Thank you. So uh, my name is Michael Terrio. I'm an investigator analyst with the Opportunities and Terror Prevention Nominee Program. Uh, I've been working with immigration for about six years. My primary role has been as uh, an officer who assesses files and makes decisions on files. But I also have been doing outreach with international students for the entire time I've worked in immigration. I originally started in New Brunswick, on, in New Brunswick Canada, out on the East Coast, visiting universities and colleges there. And uh, in the last two years, I've been working here in Ontario. So I'm very glad to be here. This is my second time at Centennial College. Uh, I'm looking forward to a good presentation. And uh, as you were told, I'm going to leave a lot of time at the end for questions and answers. The actual slideshow itself will probably only be about 15 minutes. Okay? But first, I have one question for you. Um, is anyone in this room, by just sort of a show of hands, planning on pursuing uh, master's or PhD programs in the future? Excellent. Okay. So I won't cut out that part of my presentation. So. What I represent is a way for you as international students to become permanent residents in Canada. The way that you do that is by applying through our program. So what we're going to talk about today is a little bit about the program itself, how you are eligible uh, to apply for permanent residence in this program, how you'll apply the actual process itself, and then what happens if you're approved, which hopefully all of you are. So some of the advantages of using our program over some of the other immigration programs that exist is that it's a fast track. When your application arrives at a visa office, provincial nominee program applicants are given priority process. And what that means is, is that you'll go through faster than other streams. Um, none of our streams that would apply to international students require any work experience. Um, that is going to be different from any of the federal programs. For example, if you apply into the Canadian experience class, you need to have some work experience. So for ours, as soon as you are eligible, you can apply right away. You don't need to work for a year or something like that. We also don't use a point system. The criteria that I'm going to go through later is fairly straightforward. It's basically a series of yes or no questions. If the answer is yes to all of your questions, then you're fine. You don't have to try to trade off between different criteria. Um, for those people who do have master's degrees or PhDs, you're not even required to have a job offer. And we also don't do language testing for anyone with a job offer or anyone graduating from a PhD program. So those are some of those advantages. If you have more questions about that, um, I'll just say this now. I'm not an employee of Citizenship and Immigration Canada, the people who run the Canadian Experience class, the Federal Skilled Worker Program. I'm not involved in work with study permits, work permits, things like that. So I'm not going to be able to answer a lot of questions on those issues unless they're very basic. It's not that I don't know, but it's that those rules change. They don't always tell me when those rules change. And by the time you uh, are ready to apply, those things may have changed. I would ask you to contact Citizenship and Immigration Canada if you have questions about that, or use your international student office here at the school. So the first thing is our PhD program for those of you who are interested in pursuing that in the future. So once you've successfully completed a PhD uh, from one of a uh, publicly funded Ontario University, uh, you have two years to apply to the program. And the only real requirement is that you've completed that PhD, you have legal status if you are in Canada, and that you have an intention to reside in Ontario permanently. And that's actually, I'll just say that right now, that's a requirement for any uh, program. The difference between, one of the differences between our program 
and any of the programs offered by Citizenship and Immigration Canada is that our program is only for people who intend to reside in Ontario. If you intend to reside somewhere else, every province and territory has a provincial nominee program or territorial nominee program, so you can apply to them if that's where you intend to live. So that's the PhD program. It's very straightforward. The criteria is very simple. Uh, for masters, it's a little bit more complicated. Again, though, you have to have graduated from a master's program at a publicly funded university. You have to have been studying there full time. Again, you have to apply within two years of your graduation date. And you have to be currently residing in Ontario and have legal status to do so. In addition to that, you also need to be able to score a 7.0 on an IELTS test or a 5 on the TEP if you speak French as your first language. Um, you also have to have a minimum amount of savings or income or support from family members uh, in order to make sure that you have that money because, again, this doesn't require a job offer, so you have to show that you have some savings. You have to have been in Ontario for at least one of the last two years and not be intending to continue to pursue further studies. And again, I'll add that this applies to all of our programs. The Provincial Army Program is for people intending to work in Ontario after they've completed their studies. If it is your intention to go back to school, you would not be eligible until you have finished your full education. I'll also use this opportunity to say, at one time in your lives, you're eligible for what's called a post-graduation work permit. Make sure when you apply for that, that that's when you intend to enter the labor market. If you're planning on going back to school, don't apply for that because once you've used it, it's gone and you need to have that usually to qualify for permanent residence down the road. So wait till you've completed your entire education, whether that's a two-year diploma, bachelor's degree, master's degree, PhD, wait till you've finished your education and then apply for your postgraduate work permit. Okay, so this is uh, the, main, the main program that we have for international students. So there's four things that we're going to look at today. There's four types of eligibility that you need to have in order to qualify. The first is the student yourself has to be eligible. Your program that you're attending has to be eligible, which won't be a problem for most of you. Um, the job that you have been offered has to be eligible, and your employer has to be eligible. So we're going to talk about those in order. So first, you, as international students, um, have to graduate within the last two years. That's the same as our other programs. You have two years from the time you graduate to qualify as an international student. Um, has to be at a publicly funded college or university. Easy. You're all at a publicly funded college. That's great. Um, you have to have completed at least half of your studies in Canada. And you have to have a permanent full-time job offer from an Ontario-based employer. And you have to have legal status that can be work permit, study permit, visitor visa. Usually that would be your post-graduation work permit. So this is what you need to do to qualify as an individual. In order for your education to be eligible, it has to have been a full-time degree or diploma program that would normally take two years. One question I sometimes get asked is, well, I'm super ambitious, I'm really smart, genius. I got through my program in one year. Normally it's two years. Is that okay? Yep, that's fine. We'll go and look on the website and say, okay, this is normally a two-year program because this person may be the smartest person in the history of the world. They were able to complete it in one year, one semester, whatever, and so that's okay. You can do a one-year program if it is a postgraduate program. That means if it requires a bachelor's degree in order to be eligible, then you can use that uh, in order to qualify. And you do not qualify if you're a part-time student. Uh, by the way, the way we check that is just by, we'll just call Centennial College or go on their website and say, is this a one-year, does this program require a bachelor's degree? Yes? Perfect. Good to go. So for your job, so your job has to be located in Ontario. As I said earlier, everything about this program is built around getting you into the Ontario labor market. That's what we want. Hopefully that's what you want. It has to be a permanent full-time position. So if it's a contract or a seasonal position, it wouldn't be eligible. So you have to make sure that it meets that standard. That's sometimes the more difficult one. Um, you have to be receiving at least an entry-level wage. There are wages listed on the job bank, 
Uh, if you go to that website, they have a whole section on wages for every job in every region. We look at that as the, the entry level wage that's listed on that is what we use. So if you're not sure, you can check that yourself. And it also has to be a professional occupation, a management, professional, or skilled trade occupation. Uh, and if I'm just probably going to save that for the question and answer period because that's usually where a lot of it comes from. But basically, as a general rule of thumb, if it requires a college diploma or university degree, it is considered a high-skilled education. If it requires something less than that, it is usually not a high-skilled occupation. Oh, and it doesn't have to be related to your field of study because I don't do anything related to my field of study. There is no field of study for what I do. <laughs> so, I don't know if there is one anyway. Um, so if your employer also has to qualify, so they have to have a business that is located in the province of Ontario. Again, that's really important to us. We're really picky about that. They have to have been in business for at least three years. If they are located in the greater Toronto area, which would be uh, the city of Toronto, the York region, the Durham region, Peel, and Halton regions, I'm not sure what those are, look them up, hopefully you do, uh, then they have to have at least five full-time employees and at least $1 million in revenue. If they're outside of the greater Toronto area, they have to have at least three full-time employees and half a million dollars in annual revenue. And that's it. If you can hit, as I said, it's a bunch of yes and no questions. If you can answer yes to all of those questions, most of which I think you you can see are not very difficult, then you would qualify. Um, because this is a two-stage process, your employer has to apply to us first. The way that this works is your employer sends us an application saying, I want to hire this person as an international student. Here's some information about my company that shows that I have those minimum number of employees, that minimum amount of revenue, that premise in Ontario, and then we'll say, that's fantastic. We approve this position. You would take a form that would come as part of that and submit it with your application to us. And I have a little chart that's going to do that. So you may have to do some work on your employer. If you're working for a large company, they probably already know about us. They probably already dealt with us. In that case, it's a lot easier. But if your company hasn't heard of us, it'll be your responsibility to educate them because they need, we need their buy-in in order to, to process it. So those are some tips you can direct the employer to our website. Uh, make sure that they know that their part of the process is free. Uh, and make sure that you're a really good employee so that they want to keep you. So if you're, as I said, if you're a member of the, of the Masters of PhD streams, you would submit an application to us right away. We would then, if we approve it, send it to a visa office. They would make the final assessment of that, and then you would be issued a permanent resident uh, visa from Citizenship and Immigration Canada. If you're going through that job offer program, the employer stage comes first, then you apply, then the application goes to CIC at the visa office, and then you become a permanent resident, um, provided you meet all of the criteria. So for processing times, uh, these are general guidelines on our website. Our official standard is that we complete 80% of our files within this time frame. Um, so a complete employer application takes about 90 total calendar days or 64 business days. The same is for a regular nominee application. Uh, sometimes we're faster than that. Most of this, as I said, 80% of the time is our standard to hit that benchmark. But it's very important that we put it in italics for a reason. There's a difference between an application and a complete application. A complete application means that we don't need to go back to you and ask for any additional information. The clock on that 90 days does not start until we have a complete application. So be aware of that. So after this, as I said, you would apply to Citizenship and Immigration Canada. Uh, all of the all of provincial nominee applications go to a visa office in Nova Scotia from where they're distributed out around the world. Um, the visa office you end up at can vary from time to time. Uh, in the meantime, from the time you're nominated until the time you become a permanent resident, it's going to take a little while. In that time period, it's important that you maintain your status. 
And what I mean by that is, if you were nominated because you have a job, you need to remain in that position. If you were nominated because you had a master's degree and were residing in Ontario, you need to remain residing in Ontario. If any of those conditions change, you need to tell us right away so that you can re up so you, we can check your application and see if maybe you can get restarted. Uh, otherwise, if we find out that you broke those conditions and didn't notify us, then your application may have to go all the way back to the beginning and start over. Um, so make sure you let us know if any of those conditions change. And as it says here, apply for your postgraduate work permit, but make sure that you're actually intending on working when you do that. You're not going back to school. So I'm going to leave this slide up. This is how you contact us. It is opportunities.ontario at ontario.ca. If you picked up one of our handy flyers, and it looks like most of you did because they're all gone, um, then all of that information is there. Toll-free number as well as a local number, website, Facebook. You can follow us on Twitter. I don't follow us on Twitter, but I'm sure there's lots of interesting things there for you to see. Um, so at this point in time, it, I'd like to open the floor up to any questions that we have. The question, in case you couldn't hear, is what happens if it's an international company? The answer to that is they have to have a physical presence in Ontario. They don't have to have all of their operations in Ontario. They have to have a location where you will be working in Ontario. So, for example, General Motors has operations virtually all over the world. They do have locations in Ontario, though, and as long as you're working at one of those locations, that's fine. Okay. How much is the minimal level of saving that you need to have if we have a plan for the master's sure. The question in case you couldn't hear is, uh, under the master's program, you're required to have a minimum level of savings. What are those amounts? Uh, so I want to take out a pen and write this down. I'm just going to go through uh, the first two. And that is if you have a family of one, as in just you, by yourself, then the amount is $11,086. If it's a family of two, it's $13,801. We'll probably, we'll probably let you go on the $1, though, if it really comes down to it. Um, and then it's about, I believe it's 15327 for three. And I can't remember. It goes all the way up to seven. Um, so that information is on our website, though. Mm -hmm. I believe you don't understand the part that the employer has when you're applying for that job. Because you said you should be in like an application, right? So I wanted to know how much paperwork does that company have to have or to do if they are interested in So the question is, what does the employer have to do? So if it's an employer that's already dealt with us, uh, it's, it's a different process than if it's a brand new employer. So first, if it's of an employer who's dealt with us before, we have a, a four-page form that they would fill in. It's very straightforward. It's not very difficult for an employer to fill in. Uh, and then they would need to provide us with some documents. They would need to provide us with information that proves the number of employees that they have. What we would typically ask for from that is a T4 summary, which is a document that all employees are required to have. Um, they need to be able to prove how much revenue that they have. They can do that either by providing financial statements or by providing their tax returns. Uh, and then they need to provide proof of that location in Ontario, which is either a lease or a deed for a physical property. That's what an employer would need to provide. So if Jen's, it's, got a, yeah, Jen's got a microphone, so okay. you can either ask really loud or wait for Jen to come around. <laughs> if the employer has already applied to us, and we have that information, we're not going to ask for a lease, like a Royal Bank, a, when they apply, they don't have to give us a lease every single time they apply. We, we believe you. You're located in Ontario. It's fine. Um, and if we have financial information and number of employees information, we don't ask for it repeatedly. We can look back at old files from the same employer and pull that information. But for a new employer, they are going to have to provide those documents at least that first time. So. What's that? For married people, if only one of them has, what, what's the issue of them? How, how much is the minimum level of savings? Uh, 
Oh, oh, if you're married, uh, only one person in the household needs to meet the qualifications for the entire household to be approved. Um, for example, if you are married and your spouse is back in your home country, they can still be eligible. Um, we see that a lot, especially with some of our master's students uh, from China, where they may be married and have a spouse living back in China. That spouse is still eligible as part of the application. It's only one person needs to meet the criteria. Okay. You? I'm going to make this person run around a lot. Hi. Hi. Uh, my question is like, if the employers are going to hire me, do they need my work permit or just need my post graduation uh, to apply for target assessment? Well, the, we wouldn't see anything until your stage of the application. The employer would apply for a position, and then you would apply to fill that uh, with us. Um, your employer has a right to ask to see your, your work permit, obviously, um, but I'm not sure if that answers your question or not. But. No, the question is, like, uh, I'm just going to uh, finish my post-graduation uh, right now in April, mm -hmm. but if the, uh, I apply for the work permit post-graduation, that will take some time. So can uh, the employer, if it is ready, uh, can they uh, apply before I get my work permit? Those, okay. Those kinds of questions, as I said, I can't answer questions specifically around work permit or on federal programs because I don't work for the federal government and they're the ones who look after that. Um, so I can answer questions about the provincial nominee programs and some basic ones about things like the federal skilled worker or the uh, Canadian experience class. Uh, but I'd ask you for those kinds of questions to either refer to your international student office or to Citizenship and Immigration Canada. Come talk to one of the advisors. Okay. Your turn. Um, you said there are employers that you already deal with, right? Is there any website that we can look into or find them? <laughs> <laughs> in case the, uh, oh, okay. in case people couldn't hear that, uh, the question was: Is there a way you can find out if your employer has already dealt with us? Uh, the answer is no. Privacy rules say that we can't do that. By the way, I want to say something about that. Sometimes I get questions uh, about whether or not your documents are safe with us. The immigration offices handle more confidential information about people than any other government department, including the Canada Revenue Agency. Like, we have everything. Uh, and we take very, very straight, strict measures in order to make sure that those documents are kept safe, so we don't need to worry about those kinds of things. But on the flip side, no, you can't find out anything about anyone that's applied. I have a question about the labor market of when you finish your, when you start working, and you have to apply to stay more time, and your company has to apply to you, but what's happening in this company, or what else in the government, let us say, uh, is not a problem. You have, to, you have to leave the company, but you Okay, that's actually, that is one area that I would like to address. Um, I won't speak to labor market opinions except for to say this. Um, when you graduate and you are going to get that postgraduate work permit, and that's going to give you a specific amount of time to work in Canada. When that applies, your employer would, would need to apply for a, what's called a labor market opinion. For those who don't know what that is, it's basically a letter from Service Canada that says, I tried to fill this position with a Canadian resident and I failed. I would like to hire a foreign national to fill that position. If they get that letter, then they can apply for, then that person can apply for a new work permit. However, if you apply through the provincial nominee program and you are nominated, but you're still waiting to become a permanent resident, we can issue you a letter. It's called a work permit support letter and it exempts you from going through the labor market opinion process. This is a very, very valuable tool that we have as a program because a lot of times, especially if you're in a very short program, you may not have a very long postgraduate work permit. So if you're someone whose work permit would expire before you become a permanent resident, a major advantage of this program is that once you're nominated, your employer will never have to go through that process of getting a labor market opinion. Does that answer your question? Is that clear? Good. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Good. First, uh, concerning what you said about uh, one who went with a uh, postgraduate work permit, 
we're not going to be able to go back to school and study a master or anything. Is that because we're going to be totally banned or, or prohibited for studying? Or because we're going to be able, because we cannot ask for the government that we have or pay anything? I mean, just I don't get that. Once I get the, the work permit, and I'm going to be a resident. So 10 years from now, I want to, I want to, just, I want to start. OK. Um, so. The question is, I guess everyone can have a question. So the intent of the program is to get people into the labor force. It does not prohibit you from ever going back to school for the rest of your life. Um, if you are planning on going back to school in the very short term, then you would not be eligible for that pro for this program. As you said, in like a 10-year time horizon, it's fine. Once you become a permanent resident of Canada, though, unless you committed fraud as part of that application, that's it. You have all of the same rights as anybody who's a permanent resident or citizen of Canada. The immigration office can't come back and say, we thought you were going to go work. You need to get out of school and go back to work in that job. You have the same rights, the mobility rights, all the same rights as anyone who's a citizen or a permanent resident of Canada, unless you committed a serious act of fraud, in which case they could pull that back, but that almost never happens, so don't worry about that. And you know that a few people are going to commit serious acts of fraud anyway, so. But if you did want to go back to school in the future, you would you would be able to. What is the, what is the time frame for doing it? The time frame is, and we have a right as a program to withdraw our nomination up until the point when you become a permanent resident. Yeah, we have some questions from online. Do you mind Go ahead. We can do a couple of those. Sure. Okay. Um, hi, sir. My name is Manan. I'm an international student. I want to know whether I need a permanent job after after graduation to apply to Opportunities Ontario. I think you did address that, but I think you can sure. elaborate it. Uh, okay. it says, uh, because new graduates do not get permanent job offers immediately. So we know you did say that they needed a permanent job offer. How long do they have to get that then? OK. So it's a very good question. As I said, this is one area where um, the program is challenging for international students, is that we do require a permanent full-time job offer for people who require a job offer. Um, so you have until two years after you graduate to apply for this program as an international student. If you go beyond that two years, you can still apply to the program, but you would no longer be applying as an international student. You would be applying under our general category as a skilled worker. That has some additional requirements. Your wage has to be higher, for example. It has to meet the prevailing wage, not the entry-level wage, and you have to have two years of work experience in that occupation in order to qualify. And again, that still has to be a permanent full-time job. So you could still apply for the program after that two years, but it would be as a skilled worker and not as an international student, which is a little more difficult. Now getting back to the question about contracts and seasonal work and things like that. If you're in that situation and you're not able to get out of that situation, what I would recommend is that you apply to the Canadian Experience class because that program does not have any restrictions as it pertains to contract work, things like that. So that might be the better option in that case. Uh, okay. Okay, hello. Uh, I'm done with the two year program I'm taking in Toronto. And then let's say I get a job in another province. Is that a problem when I want to apply for residence? It is a problem if you want to apply for the provincial nominee program in Ontario, because as I said, this is a program specifically designed for Ontario. It's probably not going to be a problem for you in general, though, because you can, like, let's say, for example, you're going to move to Alberta. Alberta has a provincial nominee program. So you could apply to their provincial nominee program. The criteria is going to be different. The requirements are different. It's a different province. They can make up whatever rules they want, just like we did. Um, or you can apply through the federal programs, and they do not care where you live, as long as you live in Canada. So if that's the case, you know, it's not going to be a major impediment to becoming a permanent resident, but this is not the correct program for you to apply to. Is there a quota for accepting applications? If there is, what is the time frame? The so, time frame? Uh, I, I guess they want to know how, like I know CSC has 
they're they're they have a goal that they're looking to process this many. <laughs> so the question um, basically is about caps. We call them caps in immigration. Every immigration program, whether it's spouses, whether it's refugees, whether it's skilled workers, has a cap on the number of people who can be approved each year. It's not an application cap, it's an approval cap. Um, so for the provincial nominee program, the cap is 2,500 nominations per year. Last year, for example, it was 1,300. The year before that, it was 1,000. So it is growing rapidly at this point in time. Um, so we are anticipating this year that we will have lots of room for the people that apply. However, if your application comes in toward the end of the year, we may reach our target a little bit before then. In that case, if you're not out of luck, we will sit on your application until the new year when we start processing again, and then your application will be one of the first ones out as part of the new batch of nominations that we get at the beginning of the subsequent year. If your application is one of those ones that are being sat on, that are kind of like on, on the shelf, can you still continue to work um, while your application is being processed? Yes, you have to continue to work in order to remain eligible for the program. So, uh, what if your postgraduate work permit ends? Um, will you be able to work because your uh, your uh, PR application is in process? Okay, if you if that would be a very unfortunate situation, um, but not necessarily terrible. Uh, we do watch work permits when they come into our office. If you could actually see one of our physical files, right in the top right hand corner of every application that has a work permit is the expiry date of that work permit, so that we know. And so if we're coming down to the end of the year and we've got 50 spots left and you know we're not just going to process the next 50, we're going to look and say, okay, do any of these people need to get this out in time? And so it is something that we take into account. It doesn't mean we can accommodate everyone. Um, you may have to have either, you may have to apply for a new work permit, uh, but we certainly do everything we can to make sure that people's work permits don't expire before we can issue that nomination certificate. Once the nomination certificate's issued, then it's smooth sailing. Because then you can get that letter, which allows you to get a new work permit without an LMO. We'll take some more questions from the audience. Sure. Do you have any? Yeah. The with this black t-shirt and the glasses. Guy with black t-shirt and glasses, go. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. What happens with one year post graduate students? Yeah, uh, the, as I said, if it's a if it's a normal diploma program, it has to be two years. If it's a program that is a one year postgraduate certificate program that requires a bachelor's degree to be eligible, that is okay. We will go on the website for Centennial College. We will see if the bachelor's degree is listed as one of the entry requirements. If it is. You're fine with a one-year certificate, postgraduate certificate. I'll let the person with the microphone decide who's turn it is so that I can hear you. The last, the last, the last question. The, okay. So, so if it's a two-year, everyone can please be quiet. Okay, if you are a postgraduate student, you have a bachelor already. Yeah, if you are applying to a two-year diploma program, no worries, no worries at all. If you are applying to a postgraduate certificate program, a one-year program, and that program requires you to have a bachelor's degree, then that is also an eligible program. So one-year postgraduate certificates are okay. Two-year diplomas are okay. Uh, a one-year diploma program, though, not. In fourth year, program Any two-year diploma is fine, but a one-year certificate is also fine as long as it requires a degree. I'm not sure how I'm following. Two years. And then postgrad program is two years. Any two-year program is fine. Any, yeah, any two-year any two-year diploma program is fine. One-year programs are fine as well, as long as they require a bachelor's degree to get into the program. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna follow. I'm gonna be following the microphone around just so I have an easier time hearing the questions. So go ahead. Hi. Ah. My question. 
you said that the company should be your the team, what are the employees you should be having and the family and the Sorry, I'm going to interrupt you. Um, nine times out of ten, we all have the similar question. So if we're all listening to the question, chances are that your question will also be answered. So I'm going to ask everyone to respect the person with the microphone, whoever has the microphone, and so we can all listen. Okay? Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, so again, I'll repeat my question is that if you said that the company should have three corporate employees and the family thousand revenue for the years, so is there, I um, mean, if it's a small company, say you have two permanent employees or one permanent employee, and I have a permanent job offer, then I'm not eligible for this uh, permanent resident plan. You would not be eligible with that employer. Um, you have to have a leave. We, are, we want to make sure that these companies are well established in order to be able to support applicants in the long term. And so, we were, as I said, three years in business at least three full-time employees and at least a half a million dollars in revenue outside the GTA with higher thresholds in the GTA. Can you show me the uh, eligibility of the... Just one second. Go ahead. Can I? Yep. Okay. Uh, my question is if the two-year deadline is for the free screening application of the employer or the one that the student can uh, as to send when the, the employer has been accepted already. The two year deadline is for your application to reach our office, not the employer application. The microphone is making this way around. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Is it important to work uh, after the graduation in your field uh, only, or uh, you can work in any field to apply for the presidency? I'm sorry, I didn't quite get the question. Is it important to work uh, uh, in your field? And no, uh, you can accept any job that's a high school occupation regardless of what you study. That's a full time job. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't matter if it's related to your field of study, as I said. I'm not working in my field. I think marketing. <laughs> Thank you for everyone. Uh, I just uh, want to ask uh, you, for example, I have to apply in the same time if I have a job offer for a tour, or I, I can apply after some time, for example. As soon as you have a job offer and you have completed your studies, you can apply. You don't need to have a certain amount of work experience for this program. Uh, basically, the minute you meet all of the criteria that I outlined, you can apply right then. There's no amount of time you need to work. Sometimes our international students haven't actually started working yet when the application arrives at our office. That's fine, because we don't require work experience. You just have to meet all the criteria. Um, the guy with the hell of the family prior time. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, go ahead. Uh, know about cases uh, an employer re refused to give this sensitive information? Uh, <laughs> like revenue? Yeah, uh, there has been some cases where employers have not been willing to share uh, that information with us. Uh, as in those cases, the options would be for you to apply to the Canadian Experience class, Federal Store Order Program, or something of that nature. It is something that we do require. The only way we might make an exception to that is if it's like a publicly traded company and all of their information is free online anyway, and we can just go look at it. Um, usually those people though, are willing to just mail us a name and report, and that would be all that would have all the information you need in it. So. I know you already addressed the um, employer with the minimum of employees. Um, we asked a question, but it's a follow up question. It's a firm that was in, has been in business for like one of 10 years with four employees. And the hiring me the fifth. Would that qualify? Because I would be qualified what the employer would be. Right. The question is, uh, can you be that third or that fifth employee? Uh, anyone who is on a work permit, uh, whether it's yourself or another employee, who would not be counted as one of those employees. Someone I think has a microphone. Oh, okay. Sorry, just a second. Oh, okay, yeah, go ahead. You were going to say something. What is the cost of applying for this, for this uh, program? 
The cost for international students is fifteen hundred dollars for your household. Is there a requirement of the last of the last program? For example, now I've got a one-year uh, economic uh, master and a two-year academic program. So do you have a favor of the last of the master program? I'm um, sorry, you said you got a two-year MBA program? That you and a one-year economic master program. So the, and my question is, uh, do you have a requirement of the last of the master degree? Of the length. Oh, the length. Yeah. Uh, yes, the master's degree needs to be at least one year. So for two semesters. So uh, a two semester master's program would be acceptable. Hi, so uh, I just checked the uh, CIC website and it says uh, you need at least one year for all full time experience or the equivalent in part time work as a skilled worker in Canada, this is under uh, CEC. Yeah, that's under the Canadian Experience class. That's a federal program. That's different than what we're talking about today. So, uh, should I follow up? Uh, so, I think your question is, what's, are you asking, like, should you apply for one versus the other? Yeah. It's kind of big, as I said, there's a lot of things to consider when you're applying for immigration. Um, the right the right program is going to be different for different people. As I said, if you're someone who's working in a contract position, uh, if you're someone who's working in a seasonal position or a part-time position, the Canadian experience class is the better choice. If you're someone who does have a full-time position and you don't want to wait until you have that work experience, you want to apply right away, then we would be the better option in that case. So it's different. There's no right or wrong answer to this that's universal. It's a case-by-case -case and you need to look at yourself. Also, again, as I said, if you have a short postgraduate work permit and that's going to expire before you become a permanent resident, you may really want to consider the PMP program because we can help you get that extended all the way through with the uh, other programs going on for that. So it's going to be different for everyone. Is there okay. Hi. For example, if I am in a program that requires uh, permission from the government, like I'm a part of your program, so I have to make a test to get the permission. I need to have the permission to apply to the program, or I can be in the process to get it and having a job offer before the permission. How's that apply? Uh, as long as the work you're doing is considered a high skilled occupation, then you're okay. I'll give you um, an engineering example. So, if you're an engineering technician, that is considered a high skilled occupation. If you want to eventually become an engineer and you're working your way towards getting whatever accreditation is required for that, that's fine. Uh, as long as the job you accept is a high skilled occupation, as I said, it doesn't have to match your experience. If you are working in a position that requires accreditation, you must obviously have that accreditation. That's not an immigration rule, that's just like a, a regular law of the land uh, for certain fields. Um, but it's not necessary as long as your position is eligible. As long as the job you go into, like you don't have to have that higher job, as long as the job you're going into qualifies as a high skill occupation, which is most likely there. Hello. Hello, if I got a master's degree from a foreign country. The master, in order to be eligible for the master's program, it has to be a publicly funded Ontario school. So even if you go to Quebec, we wouldn't accept it. But you would have got a job offer uh, because we just require for job offers. It can be any school in Canada. Hi, where did my company uh, My company, the criteria requires it complete all the criteria and apply for a PR. And what if I get laid off between? If you get laid off in the meantime, um, you need to let us know. Uh, and if you find another job. We may be able to keep your permanent resident application moving, um, but you are going to require, be required to have a job offer uh, from an employer in order to be eligible. What if I don't like the job? If you don't like the job, I need to let you know. If you don't uh, let us know and we find out on our own, then we'll probably, then we would most likely pull the nomination. Yeah, but what if you don't like that? <laughs> If we don't, that's a, no, that's a fair question. Um, if we don't find out, 
you may successfully be able to pull off a case of immigration fraud. That is not something that, is not something that I would ever encourage anyone to do. Um, but that is what that would be called, yes. We're going to take three more questions. Okay, guys? Three more. What's that? Yes. Yeah, the, the, there are fees for, I'm just going to talk about fees in general. There are a lot of fees that happen around immigration. There will be a fee when you apply for the promotion on the program. As I said, that's $1,500 for an entire household. Um, when you apply for permanent residence through a visa office, whether it's through our program or through the Canadian Experience class, there is a $550 fee per for you, your company spouse, and a $150 fee for any dependent children. At the end of the process, unless these were changed, I'm just going to say I haven't checked these in a while, so they might be different. Last time I checked, though, there is a $490 fee for a right to permanent residence that comes at the end of the process uh, for yourself and your one spouse. My second question. Um, I want to know what program is going to apply for this in Centennial. What's that, sir? I want to know the program is not going to apply for this in Centennial. I believe Centennial has an extensive range of programs available, uh, so I'm not sure offhand which ones would be, wouldn't be eligible. But as I said, one year postgraduate certificates or two or more year diploma programs would be eligible. Do we have the fee for um, just the question was, and this is a fair question, um, the fifteen hundred dollar fee uh, is that paid by the applicant or by the employer? The fee happens at the application stage, the nomination stage. Um, so some employers will pay for that, some won't. We don't care who pays it, as long as we get it. <laughs> I uh, was just wondering um, if your family or your um, members that are staying in Canada yeah, they apply for permanent residence. Uh, if I apply for this, will that interfere with that process or is that separate from each other? That's a very good question. Uh, this comes up a lot. Uh, and it actually is part of, I guess, of a broader question of can you apply, have more than one permanent resident application on the go at the same time? A um, couple of points on that. Uh, if you have an application for permanent residence in the works already, you're not eligible to apply for the permanent only program. It's also generally a bad idea to apply for more than one permanent resident application at a time because they are very expensive and you only get one permanent residence at the end of it. <laughs> um, so, generally advice, it's been, I mean, it is technically possible, but if it's caught, as I said, you'd have to withdraw from one of the programs. Um, and but it's also not a very good idea anyway. So. Well, what I meant is that my mom is the one who's actually applying for permanent residence. I'm a dependent child, so does that mean I'm the applicant? Yes, yes. that means you are an applicant. You are if that if that is an active application, and you are an applicant for permanent residence. So you really don't even need to apply, assuming that your mother is able to be approved. Right. If that process is something that's going to take a while, some family class sponsorship cases can take a very long time, depending on what country you're from. You could withdraw yourself from that application and apply for something that might be uh, completed in a faster timeline. But you wouldn't have be able to have both of them going at the same time. Uh, quick last question. Uh, what, what are the like, chances for um, the acceptances, or how many people did get accepted in the previous years if you're able to release that information? Uh, the approval rate, like a percentage of people, I'm honestly not sure offhand. It's quite high. We don't have, especially around international students, our approval rates are very low. Um, but I'm not sure the exact percentage offhand. Um, but we will fill it. We will use all 200, 2,500 application spots this year for sure. Okay. If I apply for this program and I don't get nominee, can I, uh, after that, apply for the CEC uh, program? Yes, um, there is no, you can even turn around and apply again to the PNP if you wanted to. Um, you can apply for permanent residence as often as you want. Um, being turned down does not make you ineligible uh, to apply in the future. 
I have like the same questions asked by like five people. Uh, can I or if, if my PR application is denied, can you appeal? Um, that would be generally yes. You can you can appeal anything either through mechanisms set up by Citizenship and Immigration Canada that tend to vary depending on the stream you're applying under. Uh, I'm not going to touch that. Uh, you'll have to go to CIC form. If your application to the provincial nominee program is turned down, you do have the ability to apply for that to be reconsidered by a different officer, a senior officer. Um, that is a, that's freely available. The uh, timelines on that are 120 days, uh, calendar days, in order for your reconsideration to be heard and a decision to be made. Okay, so how many people do you accept uh, uh, applicants per year? We accept all the applications that arrive in our office. We nominate 2,500 applications per year. This year, last year I said it was 1,300. The year before it was 1,000. I don't. They haven't released what the number will be for next year, but for this year it's 2,500. Okay, this is probably the most important question. I know that we're kind of short on time. Um, you guys want to get everyone out of here, but this is really important. The question is, how do you, or basically, how do you know if you're in an eligible position? And by that, I'm assuming you mean high skill. How do we define that? Okay. So, general rule is, if it's something that requires a post-secondary education, it is considered a high skill occupation. Now, that's not to say that that's going to be correct all of the time. The way that it is defined is by Service Canada has this gigantic system where they've classified every single job you could ever possibly imagine in Canada into a grid. And some jobs they classify as being high skill, and some jobs they classify as being medium or low skill. Um, jobs requiring a college diploma, two year college diploma, are considered uh, skill level B, which is high skill. Uh, university, master's or PhD degrees are considered uh, not skill level A, which is also high skill. Any type of manager or supervisor position is considered high skill. So if you're working in skilled trades, if you're working in a professional setting, you're going to be okay. Here's what you can do if you're not sure. If you're not sure, you can go to the job bank and you can type your job title into the search bar. And what it will do there is it will give you a whole bunch of information about that occupation. It will be able to tell you whether or not there is, as I said, there's five things. There's O, the letter O for management occupations. I don't know why they didn't just make that A, but that's not my decision. So there's O, A, and B are considered high skill occupations. If there's a little C next to that or a D, then it's considered a low skill occupation. So that's on the job bank. You can find that out. Um, an important thing to remember about that, though, sometimes employers like to give you very fantastical job descriptions. They may make you the vice president of communications over sector seven, and what that is is someone who answers phones uh, about broken vacuum cleaners. We don't look at your job title. We look at your job description. So make sure that your job description matches with the job description of a high skilled occupation. Um, I heard the news because uh, all of the PNP will be cancelled uh, for next year because the OI coming. Is that true? That is absolutely untrue. <laughs> there are major changes coming to Immigration Canada in Canada next year. The PNP is not going to be we have already confirmed that. Um, expression of interest is going to be changing the way that federal immigration works. So things like the Federal Skilled Worker Program and the Canadian Experience class may be very different next year. I don't have the details of how that works yet. Um, but the Prevention Nominee Program is still going to be existing and probably, and it's actually going to be taking part in the expression of interest model how all the details of that works hasn't been worked out yet. But do not be concerned that expression of interest will mean that the programs I've talked about today will be canceled. 
For the final factor. For the final factor. For the final okay. Um, it depends. Uh, generally, the standard is about 13 months at the visa office for provincial nominees. That is not an absolute number. That is just the most recent batch. 80% of them went through within 13 months. That's what that number means. So if it takes longer or shorter, and that's just the most recent batch, that doesn't mean that whatever goes through at your stage will be the same, but that's the best number I can give you. And how long do you have to work in the same company? If, you're, if you are in a position that has that job offer, you need to still be working in the position up until the time you become a permanent resident. At least. Say that I go for away today and I get a job tomorrow and I'm a wonderful worker and uh, Good for you. I talk to, to human resources, hey, can I apply to your company to this program? Can they apply give that form and, uh, and can I apply in that moment? Or do I have to wait a specific period of time? The question, the question is, do you have to wait uh, to apply for a certain amount of time? No, as long as you meet all of the criteria, which is the job offer, not work experience, just the offer, and you have completed your program, so you have that diploma in hand, then you're good. I'm fine. I can keep going as long as I'm good to keep going. Do you have any more online? Yeah, I'm just asking how to do it. We're going to take a few questions. Okay, you go ahead, now we're going to do some other ones. Very good question. Uh, last year, uh, the Canadian Experience Class and Federal Student Worker Program put restrictions, I think I've actually just the Canadian Experience Class, put restrictions on six occupations and said, we are not going to accept these six occupations anymore. They were to do with uh, administrative assistants, reception positions, cooks, uh, I'm not sure I can't remember, things of that nature. There were six of them that were restricted ultimately. We do not at this time have those types of restrictions, and I have no uh, knowledge of any efforts undertaken within our office to put those in. So as of right now, um, you would still be eligible if you're in a cooking, a reception, and an assistant type program. You can still apply to the community. We have some questions online, Greg. Um, yeah. So hi, my name is Victor. I'll be graduating from avionics technology. To apply for the PMP program, do I have to work as an avionics technician? So, no. No. <laughs> no. No. Is this not working? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, right on. Then I, I, a lot of these questions are, are about the type of work. So, uh, I, you, you talked about this uh, already a bit with the with the skill level A and B, but a can a student apply for this program if they work at, at a restaurant as a cashier or GHP the manager? A uh, cashier is not an eligible occupation. If you're in a restaurant, the supervisors and the uh, professional drink cooks uh, would be considered eligible occupations. And, man and managers and as well. Hi. I'm having a Oh, there you are. Okay. Hi. Um, with a situation like that, uh, my PMP board approved and my visa board expired. Does it have to go back or I can stay here? If your PMP is approved uh, and your work permit expires, we can issue a letter so you need a work permit to send it. So don't leave the country because it might not be eligible anymore. <laughs> <laughs> stay keep working. Okay, sorry guys, we are going to cut it off with our questions and give you lots of bonus questions, right? Um, okay, so if you have burning questions, I'm going to ask you to use this contact information um, to connect with Michael and his peers. Um, and so before you leave, can we all give a warm centennial thank you for Michael? Thank you so much.
much for coming. Um, we have 200 students seated in this room, but we have actually 5,200 international students on campus. So I hope the other 5,000 are all online um, checking, checking this important information out. Um, we don't have feedback forms, but if you liked what you heard today, if you want more information sessions like this, um, connect with us on Facebook, talk to an international staff, um, tell us what we want more of, and we will be open to listening um, and organizing more information sessions. Um, unfortunately, Michael is not going to be able to take one-on-one -on -one questions, so again, use the information on the two slides to connect with your provincial nominee program representatives. Hello. Thank you again. I just want to add one. Oh, great. I also just want to add to everybody that this whole session was recorded, so it's now uh, automatically on our YouTube channel. So you can check the international Facebook page, and I'm going to share that link. So if you want to rewatch it, um, you'll be able to. Uh, maybe you you weren't clear on the question, and you want to hear the answer again. So you guys too online can watch it on uh, YouTube. Okay. Thanks for coming. <laughs> So we're going to have some of the advisors now address some of the questions that um, that didn't get answered yet. Some of them weren't exactly about the Ontario Provincial Nominee Program, uh, but we will still answer them, but the, the, our, our international student advisors will, will do that, not uh, the Ontario PMP rep. So uh, just give us a minute, and when that classroom clears out, it gets a bit quieter, uh, our advisors will answer some of the questions that haven't been uh, picked out yet. Let's see the eligibility of the employer. You want the power? Yeah, I have it. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, okay, I have it. I have the slides too here. Thank you so much. Do you follow our international Facebook page? Facebook, you can write it down here. Or you can just add it on your phone right now. When you graduate, students typically you should be thinking of post-graduation work permit. And while you're on the work permit, you can look into different pathways to become a permanent resident. So this was one of the permanent and provincial nominees of one of the real so that's a, that's a federal program. That's a Canadian experience for us. This is a provincial program, and you have to have a job offer to apply for this program, but you don't need a certain experience, or long years of experience to apply, but you have to have a long uh, job offer. In the, yeah, in the skilled labor category, then yes, it's called not. It has to be not OAB. Not uh, yeah. The information is, is there. And, um, uh, yeah, Greg is gonna post it on the Facebook page. So you can, this was recorded, so you can revisit it again.
I think for this one, Michael said it's probably about 13 months. The federal program typically takes a lot longer, so federal information is all available on the CSC website. That's what he said for the province. There's some, some you might be able for bridging of work permit. It depends on the situation. You might be able to your employer year might be able to help you to extend it, but it's just my case, so they can't really tell you. But there is an option for bridging of work permit. It needs to be one million or it's like if something is like nine hundred thousand. I I think he's I think whatever he said, it has to be yeah. If he says million then it has to be million. And how long normally does it take the process? I think he said thirteen months, right? I don't know. I think from starting from the input. Yeah. And uh, I don't need work from like kind of the job offer and what my degree to do. No, but you have to keep your status. You have to be on the work no, for, permit. For, right? In order to be when the employee is being employed for, for the first assessment. Yeah. Do they need my own permit or just leave my degree? Who? Who does? The employer or? Uh, well, they will have to. You have to have a work permit in order to work for them. So you're not they're not gonna hire you if you don't have the work permit, right? But that's why this is great because international students are eligible for post grad work permit. So then if you find a, a job offer using your post grad work permit, then you'll be able to apply. I think we're out, but it's on their website. You go to Thank you so much, the immigration system is going towards the same system as I was going to do a lot of the matrix but I have to go to the matrix. 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 I
And that's probably the way so Yeah, we got tons of questions. There's still lots. Yeah, I think. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Hi, I have a study permit till July 30th, 2014. I was registered for one year program and couldn't complete the course due to rejection of my loan. Am I eligible to go home to my country and then come back to Canada before my visa expires? Uh, very likely, but it's best to bring your passport study permit uh, and come by to international office and speak to one of the advisors. All right. Just to double check. Um, we talked about the appeal question. Can I apply for PMP if I'm a baker in Tim Hortons? I'm not sure about that. Where is that? It's right here. So this is regarding the, oh, okay. the different categories. Yeah, that I, I don't know 100%. Baker it might has be a skill, though. Yeah, so you need to check the job. The, yeah, and knock code, like knock, knock job occupations, and it will tell you what category Baker would follow under. That would be the best. So on that slide, I'm going to finish with the slide for their website, and then you can uh, you can check that job bank on their website that uh, Michael was talking about. Two academic years is still considered the equivalent of 16 months calendar year, right? Uh, yeah, usually one academic year is two semesters, so two academic years will be four semesters, hence 16 months. Oh, I know that guy. <laughs> um, okay, thank you. Um, Hi, I, has, I had applied for open work permit for my wife last week, but the visa officer refused visa. They gave me reason that your wife uh, need LMO and you have insufficient fund. Uh, what can I what can I do now? Can I reappeal it or not? Um, that's probably another question. It's best to come and see us. Um, if you are a study permit holder, a spouse of study permit holder is eligible for an open work permit, so it might just be what you have submitted on the application, but it's best to come one of, see one of us. One on one. Okay, the rest of the questions are kind of repeats. Um, so thanks awesome. for joining us. This was the Thank first time you. that we did this on Google Classroom, great so I uh, hope it worked. <laughs> I hope you heard it okay. Uh, this link is going to go. Um, the whole presentation will be on YouTube, and I'm going to share it on Facebook now. So, um, And also, hopefully, we can get the slides and send that to all of our international students in an email. So uh, check your My Centennial email. Okay, bye.